So Jasmine Resch, this is the third and final episode of the series that we're doing on Alzheimer's disease and prevention. A really interesting series so far, I think, definitely. The first featured Dr. Lauren Greenspan and genetic counselor Jessica Gu exploring the medical side of Alzheimer's treatment and prevention with Dr. Sharon Cohen of the Toronto Memory Program. The second one that we did last week featured the first part of Leslie Beck's interview with two of the researchers who helped develop the MIND diet. They are Dr. Neelam Agarwal, she's a cognitive neurologist, and Dr. Christy Tangney, she's a professor of nutrition, both from Chicago's Rush University Medical Center. And they co-created the MIND diet, which stands for Mediterranean-Diet Intervention for Neurodegenerative Delay. Welcome to Eat, Move, Think. I'm Christopher Shulgin, executive producer. I'm Jasmine Ratch. I'm managing producer. In last week's episode, they discussed the origins of the MIND diet and what foods that you should incorporate into your diet to improve the neuroprotective nature of your eating pattern. Right. So in this episode, we're running the second and final part of Leslie's conversation with Dr. Agarwal and Dr. Tangney. This part features the women exploring the foods to avoid to improve the neuroprotective nature of your diet. They explore the benefits of the MIND diet scored approach, which is less about perfectly adhering to a diet prescription and more about trying to improve the brain health of your eating pattern. They discuss how the MIND diet might work. And finally, Leslie asks both researchers to provide their tips for regular people to improve the neuroprotective nature of their diets. Here's Leslie Beck in conversation with Dr. Neelam Agarwal and Dr. Christy Tangney. Hi, I'm Leslie Beck. Welcome to part two of my conversation with Dr. Neelam Agarwal and Dr. Christy Tangney, all about the MIND diet. Let's get right into it. So Christy, why don't we switch gears a little bit and tell our listeners some of the foods we should be limiting or avoiding. What are the brain unhealthy food groups and what are your recommendations around those? Sure. I think one of the first is, um, and an easy one at least to identify, is fried foods. Fried foods being largely coming from those from many fast food establishments, tortilla chips, potato chips. We put those all in the same category as fried foods. If you have fried fish, that goes into that. And what we recommend is to keep this to less than one time a week. So, you know, once once a month, twice a month is absolutely fine. It's not an absolute never, 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 but less than one time per week. That is what we saw based on our data, and we hope that the trial will support that effort as well. Another one that comes to mind that is also one that offers some restriction in order to get at a healthier um, brain, and that is red meats. So what we do is we recommend that people keep red meat consumption less than four times a week. So it's liberal enough to allow people to actually eat lean red meats, but we're asking individuals to consume less than four. Do you specify a serving size for red meat? Typically, we're looking at um, two to three ounces of red meat as a serving size, depending on the portion and cut. Another one that... I find personally one of the hardest to deal with, and that is uh, less than or equal to one serving of regular cheese per day. So when I say that's difficult for many folks who uh, consume quite a bit of dairy in their lives, regular cheese is less than or equal to one per day is tough for some some individuals because cheese is on a lot of different things. Of course, the rationale for that is largely the saturated fat contribution there. And cheese represents one of the largest um, contributions in the American diet. To follow up with that, it's also less than a teaspoon of butter per day. So once again, for a similar reason, based on the saturated and potential small amounts of trans fats that are in butter as well, we recommend that people consume less than a teaspoon a day. So again, there's some moderation here. I mean, you're allowed to to have butter during the week, but it's not every day and it's less than a teaspoon. So you choose when, I, I think that's the beauty of these patterns is they give people choices to make. Where does sweets fit in? 
Oh, yes. <laughs> Commercial sweets and pastries. And that includes a lot of candies and a lot of um, cakes. And we ask people to consume less than five of them per week. And that's the most nebulous serving. So, you know, when we talk about servings of cakes, it's um, a typical portion size, basically a one and a half inch slice. Uh, you're talking about a brownie, a two by two square, and it's very variable dependent upon the pastries. But we do have an extensive. And when we're talking about a chocolate bar, we're talking about uh, half a chocolate bar. So um, a standard chocolate bar. So those are the kinds of sweets that we're asking people to reduce their frequency of, as well as potentially the portions. I thought it was remarkable that even among participants whose diets only modestly, you know, followed the MIND diet that was associated with the 35% lower risk of developing Alzheimer's. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that's the great utility of the score. I do think, you know, as we're talking about scores, Christy, it's, is there something that we could add to the listeners' knowledge about how these, you know, scores are thought about or how they're developed? Because I think you know, that's the question we always get. How did you even think about a score and who else uses a score? So what are the thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think I want to reiterate what you mentioned. I think the beauty of the mind pattern and the score that's associated from that is the very fact that you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to get a perfect score in order to uh, reap some benefit. And I think that was the most positive thing that we saw because when we did a head-to-head -head comparison to a strict Mediterranean, what we defined as Mediterranean, there are many definitions, and what we did with DASH, neither of them, they were only protective in any sense of the word at the highest level. Whereas with the mind, there was there's some unique features in there that really provide potential room for movement and change. And I think that's what's so important powerful and impactful to uh, clinicians that are trying to help foster change in their clients and, and their patients that you can see change and that that change doesn't have to be a monster change. It can be a small amount of change. So when you're looking at a, a scale of 15, if you can move three to four points by making certain changes in your diets, either in the frequency of those components or in the actual substitution of some of those foods, that can actually have tremendous benefit. So getting a little bit into the weeds here, when you think about the beauty of the MIND diet is it emphasizes things that are much more attainable to, in particular, Americans. So as opposed to the Mediterranean, where the request is to consume so much olive oil every day, that request is much more moderate in the MIND diet and yet still is associated with benefit. Whereas in the Mediterranean diet, it asked for people to consume fish up to six times a week. We only need one or more in the mind diet. So there, and what I always say to patients or individuals who want to become more adherent to that diet, these are trade-offs that you make and they're, they're very reasonable trade-offs like upping the number of leafy greens that you consume. That is something that's very attainable for many people. They don't have to have 18 servings. They have to have one per day. And if they can do that, that's something very reasonable. If they can't succeed in doing that and do considerably less, half, they get a half point. So what the beauty of the MIND diet is, is it offers a halfway point for each of the components so that you can see potential to true change in achieving a target, which I think is very good for behavioral scientists, for clinicians, for the dietitians who are involved with their clients. And, and, and for clients as well, in terms of- Exactly, you know, yeah. exactly. You, they know where they're at and they know where they, where they could get to, but also just knowing that even, as you say, even if you have a half point or you've got a moderate middle range mind diet score, let's say, you still have, can get some benefit. Absolutely. So Christy, tell us about how our diet can affect our brain function. There's a strong connection to heart health, I'm aware. Can you talk about this? Sure, sure. 
Um, I, we have to credit our colleagues in cardiology because um, they were the first to really understand and study um, how dietary constituents, nutrients in particular, were associated with um, inflammation and um, how they played a role in heart health. And so I think that many of the components that we talk about being cognitively healthy are also the same components that are heart healthy. Um, so a lot of the work that was done originally with the DASH diet, that is talking about leafy greens and carotenoids. Carotenoids are a class of uh, many of them which have vitamin A activity, some of them don't, but those are the ones that uh, contribute to color in a lot of foods. They serve as a, uh, many cases, antioxidants for the plant and then for those individuals who consume um, these plants, if you will. And so that's one of the first, I think, capacities in which food uh, lends itself to um, protecting brain health. So what we do believe is that many of the um, uh, sequelae that we see with uh, neurodegenerative diseases are a, a neural uh, inflammatory process. And the consumption of the appropriate foods, that foods that are rich in antioxidants and anti-inflammatory uh, components, as opposed to those that are more pro-inflammatory, pro such as our saturated fats and such as um, some of these highly processed grains, et cetera, that this is what um, lends protection. It also lends protection in the integrity of the blood brain barrier. So one of the things that we think is very important in cognitive health is how important the vasculature is to cognitive health. And we know that um, car carotenoids, lutein's, the tocopherols, vitamin K, all of these foods that um, components that are critically involved in, in uh, many of these healthy vegetables and oils, healthy oils that we're talking about, actually uh, contribute to vascular health and vascular health in the brain. And so that's extremely important. The other piece is there has been a lot of work looking at um, the role of diet, whether it be these individual constituents or a pattern, less so in the pattern, although that, day, that evidence is growing, in looking at how the brain shrinks with age. And so that the thinning of the cortex and the, the white matter integrity is and the gray matter integrity is more preserved when we consume uh, diets that are rich in vitamin B12, when we consume diets that are rich in folate. And all of those nutrients are found in these foods that we're recommending. So I think that's one of the pieces that we recognize. So structurally, there's some changes that have gone on that are associated with this. And of course, uh, the way we primarily look at this is in how people function. You know, we use these cognitive tests, our neuropsychologists are looking at various domains so that people function better. But we know too that, there is some benefit and there's new studies even looking at whether people who had followed this diet, and again, it's based on FFQs, and when they die, do they exhibit certain pathologies and are those pathologies less in those individuals who are more accordant, if you will, to a healthier diet plan like the mind diet. And we, we actually have seen some preliminary evidence to that effect. But again, no one study proves this all. It has to be a, a multitude of things. Right. Uh, so basically then, you know, the mind diet and all the healthy foods it contains, you know, the, the nutrients, the antioxidants, the phytochemicals, perhaps the fiber, all of that can help to reduce, number one, you said inflammation in the brain. That may be one way this diet helps um, keep our brains healthy. Um, it keep our 
the blood, our blood vessels, our blood vessels in the brain, um, healthy, and and perhaps as you mentioned, which is which is fascinating, can even impact the structure of our brain, right? The volume of our brain. So we we measure the volume with a lot of our structural imaging that we do, and we can actually see the preservation. They've noted this with the Mediterranean diet as well. I have to say, but there has been some preliminary work also with the Mind diet as well. Um, and what we need is is more evidence to this degree. And the one other thing I would emphasize that we kind of touched on a little bit is that we're reducing oxidative stress to a degree. And sometimes inflammation and oxidative stress overlap. Sometimes they don't. But that that is also afforded by a lot of the same foods. And I I guess the one thing that I would like to leave our listeners with is, you know, as opposed to taking a supplement, a lot of foods have a natural complement of antioxidants. So one of the the great things about food is that you don't have to worry about creating imbalances in a lot of cases. Whereas a supplement, you may you may exceed where the benefit exists, and that we may actually there's an optimum, and we're not we're not great in understanding what's optimum with supplements, but with foods, we have a little better security here because these are naturally occurring foods. Um, Neelam, do you want to weigh in there in terms of the mechanisms by which diet may help to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease? I, I think it's it's a really important question for many because Alzheimer's disease, as you know, is affecting so many people across the globe. And, you know, many people are already having changes in their brain that we typically see with Alzheimer's from neuropathology starting 20 years before they actually, let's say, come to a brain autopsy. Okay. And this is a really very interesting area because the brain changes that are occurring are occurring where outwardly somebody may not show any signs. So this is where that discussion we had about prevention. What can you do now to to prevent, let's say, more of this neuropathology showing? And what we saw with some of our work with the MIND diet is that, you know, it basically was independent of the brain pathology. So the effect, the good effect of the mind diet on your thinking was independent of whether you had this brain pathology going on in your brain, which is, you know, for me as a neurologist, like, wow, that means, that means if this is even occurring in your brain, other mechanisms are occurring, which you just heard Dr. Tangy talk about, and maybe we should maximize those mechanisms, right? So incorporate diet vigorously into our treatment, if you will, to prevent cognitive decline and dementia and see how we can um, really make a case that this is something that should be actively looked at. Now, again, that's just some research that's going on. The same thing with, you know, the neuroimaging, of course, is really important because that we're seeing that your choices can lead to changes in your brain structure. And that's a key message for the listeners. So your choices that you make for diet can lead to the change in your brain. And that if you had, you know, in research studies have shown, if you have a lower adherence to the the Mediterranean diet, we saw that atrophy and specific range in specific areas for Alzheimer's. And so that should keep us talking more and more to folks. Hello, it does make changes on a structural level of the brain. It, it's, it's, it's incredible to see this research coming through and it's, it's very promising um, and gives hope to many people that yes, it does make a difference with this intervention. Fascinating. Neelam, can you also speak to the studies you're leading into the MIND diet intervention for people who are recovering from stroke? Um, what are you hoping to learn from, from this research? Well, yeah, I think this is this is a very exciting uh, area for for us, both Dr. Tangy and myself, and we have a very large team. But you know, it's stroke is so prevalent and is so common. If you were to ask people, do you know someone who had a stroke? Have you had a stroke? Are you caring for someone with a stroke? You'd be amazed how many people would say yes. And one of the things we know with stroke is that there is a change in, of course, in many cases, physical change, but there is a cognitive change that occurs after stroke. And even after a person goes home and is in recovery, it's very common for them to say, gosh, you know, I'm just not thinking right. I'm cloudy. I'm cloudy in my thinking. 
Um, and we're hoping the recovery will, will increase over three months. What has happened is that there has not been a dietary intervention for those persons going home from stroke to see if that can, if you will, help the brain in healing. So the idea was, let's take the mind diet and components of the mind diet and give this to people who are going home after having a stroke. And let's follow them in a similar way that we're doing it with the mind diet study to see how their memory thinking, physical functioning, their mood, how is that going to be affected? by taking this diet. And so that's what we're right embarking on right now here in Chicago uh, to roll out this study, which is really um, a very exciting area to move this diet into this patient population. Yeah, that's fantastic. That is very exciting. Are there any other studies happening right now using the MIND diet as prevention? Definitely can add this right now. It's called the US Pointer Trial. And what this trial attempts to do, it asks the question, can lifestyle improve your brain health? And it actually gives two different interventions, uh, one in which individuals are uh, guided in a team formation to do certain things that they choose to do. And if you're randomized to what we call the structured group, you're given Uh, counseling and support on adopting the mind diet, adopting a much more uh, active lifestyle. We request people to uh, do aerobic activity, balance activity, um, as well as resistance training with weights. We sign them up with their local park district or their local Y so that we actually pay so that they can come and exercise there. We also ask them to monitor their blood pressure. We meet with uh, medical advisors in the team that will talk to them about their blood lipids and their blood, uh, blood pressure. And we also create an environment for social and brain activity. So all individuals in the structured group are challenged with brain HQ. So they have to go a certain number of levels where they actually use their brain, like crossword puzzles, like anything else. But this is a particular program that they are committed to. This is going to go on for two years. We currently have recruited over 1,200 people. And this was modeled after a finished trial in which 1,200 people were followed for two years, and they saw remarkable improvements in memory and overall cognition, executive function in particular. So this was modeled after this uh, finished trial, which was known as FINGER, and we are in five sites, one here in Chicagoland, I'm the site PI. Um, The other site is Wake Forest, that's the Vanguard site, where it's led by Dr. Laura Baker. Um, She's an expert in um, gerontology and the impact of physical activity. Then there's Houston, uh, there's uh, Davis, and uh, Rhode Island, uh, New England. And the goal for that particular study is is to incorporate and to involve a minimum of 23 to 30% people of color in this study. And unfortunately, many of our studies have been focused largely, it, it, it just turned out that way that many of them were mostly Caucasians. The purpose of doing this in the States is to see that whether or not this kind of program can protect brain health for older adults who are at risk. So they have to present with certain risk factors just like they had in mind. But the thought is with the combination of a signal with a better diet, with more exercise, with brain exercise, if you will, and social interaction, we can counteract some of those things that we see. We know that people who get isolated are much more prone to decline. So the beauty of Pointer is they make new friends. They're in teams. They're in teams in their neighborhoods, which is wonderful. It's to me, I've been very pleased to be part of this. And if I had family and friends in Chicago, I'd try to get them to join because it's a wonderful study. When when can you expect the pointer trial to be completed by? 
I suspect now, like all of our trials, they have been impacted by COVID. And so we had to switch. We moved to a remote for a long time. And then we now we're back in person again. And with five different regions, all different regions didn't come on board at the exact same time. So I think 2026 is when the trial will be ended. We anticipate finishing recruitment. That is our target of 2000. We in, anticipate we'll finish that by February and March of this coming year. So then it'll be two years. So the last team, we have a team that's going to finish in October. So, they, you know, it's coming. It, we go neighborhood by neighborhood in Chicagoland so that we can include all folks who have an opportunity to join. We, we like to leave our listeners at the end of each um, episode with some concrete tips that they can use to achieve optimal wellness. And I know, Christy, we've talked we've talked about a lot in terms of diet, but I would I'd like to ask each of you um, if you could leave us with three tips that that would help our listeners um, increase their mind diet score. First, go buy or grow leafy green vegetables. Number one. Okay. If you're fortunate enough to have a garden or contribute to a community garden, I go get those leafy greens. We're very fortunate, at least for most of us, to have access to that kind of foods. Second, a handful of nuts instead of a handful of candy. Handful of nuts. I think that's a wonderful thing to do. It's satiating. The other thing I think, swap out that butter at the restaurant. Swap out that butter at your table. Try that extra virgin olive oil. I think that's a win-win. And keep it simple. You don't have to make it complicated. That's my three. Great. Thank you, Christy. Neelam, what tips would you give our listeners with respect to keeping their brains healthy? Right. So I, I look at it coming at it from a brain health perspective. So how do you keep your brain as healthy as possible? And the first thing I like to bring up is I want everyone to become very intentional about what they're eating. And how do you do that? Well, you can start to incorporate quiet time and meditation to just understand your body, but then look at what you eat and think about what could you swap out of what you're presently eating with one of the mind diet, what do we say, ingredients. And start by swapping out one thing and then reevaluate and then swap out something else. So you're starting to build up you know, your mind diet portfolio, if you will. The second thing is, now that you've done that, I want you to start walking, and I want you to start exercising, and I want you to start thinking about how exercise allows for a healthier, not only a healthier lifestyle, but healthy brain, and you're now using all those mind diet ingredients to help you move around. And then the third thing is, talk about your sleep. Get in bed and get a good night's sleep and do anything you can to do that. Because when you sleep better, you will make healthier choices. And that will feed right back into being mindful what you eat, pardon the pun, but being intentional and lead into more exercise. So that those are the three things that I would suggest. I love it. I think it was great. Dr. Excellent <laughs> advice. I agree. I wholeheartedly agree. Well, I want to thank you both so much for your time today and being with us. Um, your your work that you have done, that you're continuing to do, is certainly making a greater connection between the practice of medicine and nutrition and brain health. So thank you again very much for joining me today and sharing all your expertise um, with our listeners. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. That was our EAT host and MedCan director of food and nutrition, Leslie Beck, in conversation with two of the researchers who helped to develop the MIND diet, Dr. Neelam Agarwal, a cognitive neurologist, and Dr. Christy Tangney, a professor of nutrition, both of Chicago's Rush University Medical Center. And that concludes our series on Alzheimer's disease. And before we go, let's just sum up the advice that Drs. Tangney and Dr. Agarwal provided. So, Jazz, do you want to do Dr. Christy Tangney's? Totally. So, her tips are go buy or go grow green leafy vegetables. That's definitely a core component of the MIND diet. Also, to swap out a handful of candy for like a handful of nuts. Much better for you. Also, 
Try your best to swap out that butter at the restaurant for extra virgin olive oil instead. Much healthier and um, will get you a higher score on the Mind Diet for sure. Dr. Neelam Agarwal's tips. She also has three. Hers are become intentional about what you're eating. So engage in some quiet time in meditation and really think about what you're eating. Start walking and exercising. And then she says that sleep is really important. So get in bed and get a good night's sleep. And that creates a beneficial cycle that promotes better food choices and gets you more likely to get that exercise. It's interesting because we've definitely seen these themes come up throughout this series. Yeah, absolutely. You can follow Dr. Agarwal on Twitter at Dr. A-D-D-A. That's D-O-C-T-O-R-A-D-D-A. Or you can follow the Rush Medical Center at Rush Medical. Don't forget, though, to follow Leslie Beck. At Leslie Beck RD. That's L E S L I E B E C K R D. We'll post highlights and links that you can visit on our website at eatmovethinkpodcast.com. Say hello and send us a tip or a suggestion by emailing us at info at eatmovethinkpodcast.com. And follow MedCan on Twitter and Instagram at MedCanLibWell. Eat Move Think is produced by Ghost Bureau. I'm managing producer Jasmine Ratch. Social media and strategy support is from Chantel Gerton, Emily Bozik, and Andrew Imax. I'm executive producer Christopher Shulgin. We'll be back soon with a new episode examining the latest in health and wellness. This podcast is intended to provide general information about health and wellness only and is not designed or intended to constitute or be used as a substitute for medical advice, treatment, or diagnosis. You should always talk to your MedCan healthcare provider for individual medical advice, diagnosis, and treatment, including your specific health and wellness needs. This podcast is based on the information available at the time of preparation and is only accurate and current as of that date. Source information and recommendations are subject to change based on scientific evidence as it evolves over time. MedCan is not responsible for future changes or updates to the information and recommendations and assumes no obligation to update based on future developments. Reference to or mention of specific treatments or therapies does not constitute or imply a recommendation or endorsement. The links provided within the associated document are to assist the reader with the specific information highlighted. Any third-party links are not endorsed by MedCan.